Hello, very good morning to all and welcome back to today's Daily Dose of Market Insights. I'm Kelvin here again. Very good morning. Today will be Wednesday, the 31st of July, 2024. So before we jump straight into our Daily Dose of Market Insights for today, which is rather exciting, let's have a quick look at the disclaimer first. All right, leverage trading carries a high degree of risk and may not be suitable for everyone. Losses can exit deposits. This presentation is not an offer or solicitation to buy or sell, nor financial advice or recommendation for any investment product, as well as any forecast prediction or projection in this presentation is not necessarily indicative of the future or likely performance of the product. This advertisement has not been reviewed by the Monitor Authority, Authority of Singapore. Okay, so before we jump straight into today's short-term intraday technical outlook, I want to share with you what has taken shape yesterday in terms of key events and their impact on their respective major cross-asset classes, and as well as the medium-term inter-market dynamics that is playing out in the market right now, i.e. the global markets. So yesterday, uh, we do have a after the uh, before the close of the US stock market, this was actually the performance of what we could see on the major US stock indices. All right. So what we could see over here is that both the S&P and the Nasdaq 100 actually plunges. S&P down negative 0.5%, the Nasdaq 100 down negative 0.138%. However, the Dow Jones and the Russell 2000 managed to actually go against the intraday bearish trend of the S&P and the Nasdaq 100 up by 0.5% and the Russell to, uh, up by 0.5% for the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Russell 2000 up by 0.35%. For those who have followed my daily dose of market insights since three to four weeks ago, that shouldn't be a big surprise. Why? Because we have been kind of looking, uh, expecting this kind of K-shaped performance in the major US stock indices to actually uh, taking shape in the next couple in this medium term horizon, that means we're talking about from a multi week to the multi month perspective, where prior high flyers that is heavily concentrated on the mega cap technology stocks that has high weightage in the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500 to take a bet, pick a back seat, that means they were actually underperform, whereas the Luggets, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Russell 2000 that is primarily comprises of the small cap firm and as well as value oriented stocks that has, uh, that means Dow Jones Industrial Average has higher weightage stocks that are, have this higher value factor, will tends to actually outperform due to the bull steepening of the US Treasury yield curve. So that I've been stressing this very important intermarket dynamic scenario that has taken shape since the start of this month, which I fleshed out uh, three to four weeks ago in my almost in my every daily dose of market insights. For those who wants to have a better understanding, what is the bull steepening? You guys could actually take a look at the previous YouTube video where I explained very clearly, and I draw into this their past behavior as well when this bull steepening taken shape. So very clearly, what I could see over here is the SPX, right? Intraday bearish, okay. Towards the end of the close, it managed to inch up, but close in the red. All right, so this uh, what happened in the Nasdaq 100 as well, but whereas the Dow Jones Industrial Average managed to actually be much more stronger and in fact try to actually shape the intraday push up towards the end of the US session yesterday. So if you look at the heat map of the S&P 500, very clearly the culprit, like I mentioned again, is the mega cap technology stocks that are actually taking a bad seat right now in their underperformance because of the over optimism that is being placed on the potential future revenue drivers or benefits that the entire economy could reap from AI team play. And these mega cap technology stocks are pretty much centered on the AI, especially Microsoft, Nvidia, uh, Google, Meta, Amazon, Apple, not so much because uh, Apple is more of a consumer product, but very lately, Apple now try to actually jump into the AI bandwagon as well by introducing introducing a new AI phone in the fall of this year, AI Apple phone. So what we could see over here is very interestingly, the uh, after the after the market closed, Microsoft actually reported its earnings. So it earnings actually beat 
expectation, both from a revenue perspective and as well as a earnings per share perspective. All right, they managed to beat uh, over here. So actual 6.7 billion, estimate 6.42 billion for revenue, EPS 2.2.95 versus expectation 2.94. But why they actually fall over 6% during the after hours, after the release of the report? Because one particular business segment, which is uh, Azuri, uh, the, 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 the Microsoft Cloud, uh, a, a business which actually kind of pretty much centered on AI as well did not actually meet expectation as expected. That means, i.e., the overall cloud revenue came in at 36.8 billion. All right. Okay. No, yeah, this is the one. Okay, this is the all right. But the Azure service. Okay, so this is the one. A portion of the cloud division, they call it uh, Azure. Azuri. So Az Azuri is okay. Pardon, pardon my pronunciation. Uh, this Azuri services is pretty much centered on the AI capabilities. That means uh, to actually run uh, AI uh, related, uh, uh, we call it a uh, uh, back texting or AI form of uh, data. Uh, we call it processing using these Azure services. Actually, falls short. It actually came in at 2.85 billion versus expectation of 2.86 billion. And also for the next quarter, for the give me a minute. Uh, there was actually also yes, yeah. So these are the key. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So this the this the this 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 the portion over here that actually causes the Microsoft to actually tumbled negative uh, by six percent after the after hours trading session over here. But what's interesting over here is if we were to actually uh, look at the later I'll share with you on the intraday uh, technical outlook on the Nasdaq 100. So the Nasdaq 100 actually fall as well during the after hours. So it hit around the uh, eighteen thousand six hundred fifty because it actually closes over here. The close is at 18,796. So it went to a low of 18,650 there. 18,650 in the after hours uh, 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 trading. Okay, over here. So, but however, after hitting that key low level, the price actually rebounded because that particular low itself is a key short term pivotal support, which I highlighted earlier in yesterday daily dose. Okay, and very interestingly, in today's Asia session, we do see a pretty much swift minor V shape uh, reversal right at this level. So, later I'll touch more about this level from a short term technical perspective. So, we all know that uh, price action don't actually move. In a vertical, in a vacuum, I mean, in the other one straight line or one straight line up, it actually oscillate. So there is certain point in time where the intraday movement starts to hit pretty much either oversold or overbought. We may start to see this kind of either mean reversion rebound or mean reversion. Uh, we call it a corrective pullback taking shape in the intraday price movement. All right, so everything don't go according in vacuum. They actually, uh, uh, we call it um. We got to look thing at a different horizon, a different lens. All right, but what yesterday's uh, Microsoft earnings announcement actually implies to to us that uh, the longer term perspective for the uh, movement, the medium term, the medium term trend of the S and P, the medium trend of the Nasdaq 100 may start to shape that uh, corrective. Uh, we call it a uh, uh, we call it pullback scenario from a multi week. Perspective. So later I'll flash you guys the chart again on the daily chart and as well as the intraday chart. You guys can just see the big differences. All right. So now uh, with that, what other the key data to I'll share with your uh, that taken shape uh, today in the early Asia session is this uh, release of two key important data. One from Australia, which is the monthly uh, CPI indicator. So the monthly CPI indicator for June came within expectation of 3.8% uh, and it dipped slightly by two basis points from 4%. So also indicating to us that inflationary pressure in Australia is not as hot as initially uh, portrayed by RBA officials. So for those who actually followed the RBA officials, uh, we call it a uh, guidance. In the last meeting, the RBA governor also sounded rather hawkish among its peers. So in fact, uh, because of her hawkish rhetoric, uh, there's uh, some signs of expectation that's being priced for a potential height 
in Australia before 2024 and so that's actually going against the trend of other major central banker that actually move in line with the global economy with the exception of Japan because Japan has been in low interest rate environment for decades right so that's as Japan is an outlayer it's an exceptional case but whereas the rest of the other central banks in the world uh, especially in the developed world is looking to kickstart a interest rate cut cycle instead so that uh, we call it uh, not so rather uh, hot not so hot monthly CPI indicator from AU has kind of reduced the odds of a potential rate hike in Australia for this year and if you were to look at on a quarter and quarter basis for Q2 so this is uh, the RBA uh, trim mean CPI uh, Q2 data on a year-on-year -year basis, they have a quarter quarter and a year-on-year. -year. So both on the quarter on quarter basis also fall below expectation by zero point by one basis point. So, so market is expecting 0.9%, it actually fall lower at 0.8% Q on Q below the previous quarter Q on Q of 1% in Q1. And on a year-on-year -year basis, it's also fall by one basis point. Market is expecting 4%, uh, almost similar to the rate in Q1 but on a actual basis it came in at 3.9 percent so this trim mean take it as, as a similar as excluding uh, those volatile items like food and energy so net net overall what we could see over here is that the current inflationary trend in australia is not being as hot as being portrayed by rba officials so that actually what happened so that actually saw the Aussie selling off against the dollar in today's Asia session. So if you look at the five day rolling performance of the dollar against the other major currency, we see this uh, K shape performance taking shape again, but especially on the upper K over here. Why? Because uh, the, the dollar didn't actually continues to plunge against the yen. Uh. In fact, now the dollars try to actually strengthen against the yen. So later I'll share with you what is going on over here in the dollar yen. So this movement over here, uh, the dollar strengthening against the Aussie is due to that CPI data. But however, very interestingly, uh, in my daily dose yesterday, we also expect this uh, dollar strength against the Aussie dollar. That means Aussie dollar weakness right below their key 200 day moving average as I showed you all in the hourly chart on the Aussie dollar yesterday. Uh, on the intraday uh, outlook. So uh, this shouldn't come to a big surprise to you guys, given the fact that the intraday technical factors are negative yesterday. So in, so today's, uh, we call it uh, not so hot CPI data from Australia actually reinforce this bearish movement on the Aussie against the dollar. That means i.e. the dollar strength against the Aussie if you look at this chart perspective. Okay, and another data on share of your uh, is out this morning is pertaining to China uh, over here. So if you look at China, it actually uh, came out the official MBS manufacturing PMI for July and the services, we could call it the non-manufacturing PMI for July as well. So both of them continues to uh, saw lackluster uh, reading. So for the manufacturing PMI, it continues to show contractionary mode below 50 and it's slight, slight, it slid down further 49.4 from 49.5 in June. And as well as for the non-manufacturing PMI, is which actually represents the services sector in China, also slipped slightly lower from 50.5 to 50.2. So net net overall, it tells us that still showing lackluster economic growth in China. That means IE, do not forget, the China top policymaker has, uh, has preset a annual target growth of 5% in order for China to achieve before 2024 ends. That means there's an annualized growth of about 5%. And last quarter Q2 GDP growth on a year-on-year -year basis came down below 5%, all right, around 4.7%. So that actually, uh, uh, and coming out with this latest number up from this uh, last reading on the manufacturing PMI and the non-manufacturing PMI for the July uh, data further cemented this ongoing uh, softness in the Chinese economy, especially on an internal demand basis, given the fact that a lot of resources has been allocated towards bumping up their high industrialization policy that means centered on exporting EV to the rest of the world, that's part of the clean energy, and getting technology processes know-how in terms of getting the best cutting edge semiconductor to run AI capabilities in China, going against head on with 
the US, okay, that's that's playing out in the high tech world right now, and also the industri high industry largely also focus more on the bio medical and biosciences industry in China. So very very little resources is being allocated to actually improve the consumer spending and uh, or, or, or boost the morale or consumer confidence in China at this juncture. So given said that, uh, I believe the top policymakers is aware of that. And during yesterday's, uh, we call it a uh, political bureau meeting. So this, the uh, every month they will have a meeting between the key leadership, and usually it will be led by the presidency himself. So at the end of yesterday meeting, they actually come out with uh, bold rhetoric. Bear in mind, this is just rhetoric, just words, uh, saying that they actually vote to focus on consumer with growth target at risk. That means they might be much concerned about hitting that 5% expansion goal and also concerned about their weak domestic demand that is dragging this growth target from being achieved, that 5% annual GDP growth target that policy maker has set at the start of this year. So yes, there's a lot of rhetoric rotary going on, uh, has been taken shape, but what market participants want to see is this actual wordings or rhetoric is being put out in actual physical policy plans or stimulus. Right now, it's not clearly forthcoming at this juncture. So with that, uh, we still expect, uh, I, still, I do still expect from a medium term perspective, the China stock market and the proxy, the Hang Seng indices, to actually be trading in a more of a medium term downtrend trajectory. Yes, in the short term, we may see a bit of intraday rally or intraday mean reversion rebound here and there. But from a medium term to major term uh, perspective, the outlook is not so rosy unless the top policymaker could tell us actual uh, forthcoming physical policy that they are willing to put in place to jumpstart consumer spending. Because at this point in time, it's just all issuing of rhetorics and wordings at the end of key meetings. Okay, and also uh, since we are talking about the economic data right now, another key economic data that is taking shape afterwards in about an hour time at 12 p.m. will be the Bank of Japan interest rate policy decision and they also release their quarterly outlook report. So in this particular uh, day itself or today, there's actually a kind of a split right now. Potentially, there could be a chance, I mean, there's a kind of split 50-50, there could be a chance that the Bank of Japan could issue another interest rate hike, not cut. Uh. They cut previously in March by making their short-term overnight policy rate to positive 0% to 0.1%. And right now, market participants, a 50-50 chance that they could increase another 10 basis point higher to 0.2%. All right, but uh, what's interesting over here is that for sure they will actually come up plans to do quantitative tightening by reduce their monthly JGB purchases. So at this point in time, the JGB purchases on a monthly basis is six trillion. All right, six trillion. So uh, they will actually market participants are looking by plans from a long term basis to actually cut it down by half, three trillion per month. But they do, they will not do it in one shot, but very likely to phase it out and potentially they could actually cut by one trillion first, targeting on the longer end of the curve, the 10 year JGBU. Then do not forget over here, this particular movement or bond purchase reduction is not new because in the previous meeting in April or so, uh, BOJ has already announced that this July, they will actually come up with this formalized plan on reduction of their JGB uh, monthly bond purchases, very clearly indicating to us that they want the market participants or want the JGB market to actually dictate the movement of the JGB yield rather than the Bank of Japan keep on suppressing JGB yield because they are no longer in the year curve control program that has been abolished in March meeting. All right, so very clearly Bank of Japan right now is trying to actually guide market that they are go heading towards a normalization of their prior decade of ultra dovish policy. And with that, uh, market participants actually jump ahead of the gun by selling off the dollar against the JPY. Okay, they already sold off ahead of the gun. So that particular news has more or less has been priced into the market, all right, priced in the market. Okay, so this is the current, uh, we call it, uh, 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 news flow that is impacting the current major cross-asset 
prices right now. Okay. Oh yeah. Before one more, one more thing before I go is uh, due to this uh, there's this particular joint political risk tension where Israel actually uh, strikes Beirut yesterday uh, due to last week and uh, a daily attack on Kolan, uh, which is a part of Israel. So that actually causes a uh, gold price to spike up to the 2004 level as well by XAU slash USD. So, but that also shouldn't be a big surprise for you guys because we do cover in my daily dose of market insight that. The short term intraday technical trend for spot go XAU slash USD still remains positive. And since uh, this particular news flow actually reinforced the positive technical, uh, we call it uh, elements that's inherent in the gold price itself, it really hit the resistance that we actually mentioned yesterday, the short term resistance at 2411. So, what's next for spot go XAU slash USD? I will cover later in the short term intraday technical outlook. All right. So now let us now jump to the medium term uh, focus on the fundamentals and the intermarket dynamics that's playing out right now. All right. So like I mentioned earlier on, the dollar yen movement on the shorter term more or less has really been priced in today's potential. Uh, we call it uh, more or less slightly mild hawkish guardians for the Bank of Japan. But what markets may not have priced in is the outlook the quarterly outlook that is going to be issued by the Bank of Japan today as well. So every three months of the BOJ monetary policy meeting, so this will be the quarter one, every three months they will actually release their quarterly outlook on the economic trend and most importantly market participants will focus on the inflationary trend or projection as being portrayed by BOJ members forecast. So this is what, my, what I mean, okay, so this is the PDF document that I obtained from the previous outlook report in their April monetary policy meeting. So just nice, every three months, May, June, July. So July is the next, the other three, the next three months after April, they will release their new outlook. So market participants will be focusing more very closely on prices because this prices movement will actually dictate or give a hint going forward how forceful or how confidence that BOJ will want to actually embark on in their normalization policy from a decade plus of ultra negative and low interest rate environment in Japan, pardon me. Okay, now let us go down to the bottom of the PDF document. Okay, so this is the table, all right. Okay, so how do I read this table, okay? So basically, right, Japan operate in fiscal year. So fiscal year, they actually start from the so-called 1st of April until 31st of March next year. So this will be fiscal year 2024. So they kick start in 1st of April 2024, all the way up to 31st of March 2025. And fiscal year will be kick start on 1st of April 2025, all the way up to 31st of March 2026. Okay, so this is how Japan operates out itself. They don't go by calendar year, they go by fiscal year. So let's look at this fiscal year 2024 that is still running. So previously, this is uh, this is the main reference that they're looking at. CPI, all items, less fresh food and energy. They call it the core core CPI. So this shouldn't be a big surprise for those who follow my daily dose because I did mention what is core CPI and core core CPI in Japan. So I don't want to stress more about that again. So right now, the fiscal 2024, the previous range forecast was 1.7 to 2.1 percent all right so this one box over here was the forecast made in january 2024 that means the previous month one you realize there was actually a slight upgrade in the lower end of the forecast previously is what 1.6 percent all right it's stretched higher to 1.7 the median still the bracket one over here, this is the median, that means the center, statistically median, that means we talk about the center. The center still remains at 1.9%. So right now, if gross market doesn't really focus more on the outlook so far, market seems to be more focusing more on the bond purchases, the amount of bond purchases that they will likely reduce and potentially whether they will hike rates today, okay? But if BOJ starts to upgrade their physical to, to 2024, that means this year CPI, core core CPI forecast to much higher than this range, especially on the median. So if the median starts to go to 2% or more, that means IE, they actually sound, they will just tell the market, they're actually pretty much sounding pretty much confident that Japan inflation scenario 
has starts to stabilize at around the 2% level. Do not forget the core core inflation trend since Q1 this year, it slowly starts to decelerate. Only last month and this month also, the core core CPI trend built on the, the Japan, the nationwide one, starts to stabilize slightly around the 2% level based on the last month of May and uh, May and June. Okay, so now what's interesting over here is next year forecast as well. So next year forecast is still kept at this 1.9% for the median. So if this next year forecast starts to get upgraded as well to 2% or more, that could actually send in a very strong messaging to the market that potentially uh, BOJ right now is pretty much confident that this year growth and next year inflation growth has starts to stabilize above that 2% level i.e. it give us give them more uh, we call it confidence to take further steps to hike interest rate further going forward next year so that could potentially be in a longer term perspective that means from a medium term perspective strengthening the yen against the dollar that means i.e. from a medium term perspective the dollar yen could actually fall much further from this level okay last rise again this is a medium term perspective Intraday, it could oscillate within the medium term trend. And don't forget, the medium term trend of the dollar yen is more likely inching downwards towards the downside. Later, I'll share with you on the technical chart, on the daily chart, that you guys can actually see a bigger picture from that. Okay, so now these are the data that's not been priced into the market yet at this point in time. Now, another thing I'll share with you all is looking at the JGB yield spread against the US yield us treasury yield over here so what we could see over here is that the two-year jgb yield now starts to inch to a new 52 week high it actually broke above the may high all right now trading at 0.44 percent okay and this level over here i think is the highest level since what 20 years or 30 years ago if i go to the weekly chart let me see that right okay so this level is almost the highest since april 2009 okay so this two-year jgbo is actually moving very sensitive in line with the monetary policy that boj will undergo and given this ongoing bullish trend of the two-year jgbo it implies to us that boj is solely on the path of hiking short-term interest rate all right and with that if you look at the yield spread between the jgb yield okay sorry it's hang right now okay let me open up again okay so now let me reduce this so that you guys could see reduce this reduce this yes great so now if you look at the two-year treasury yield minus off the two-year jgb yield is continue to inch downwards and right now testing the major support of 3.84%. So if this support level breaks, that means IE it will further reinforce this medium term downtrend of this yield spread. So indicating to us that the yield premium between the two year treasury yield against the two year JGBL get narrower and narrower. That means IE is no longer attractive to use yen as a carry trade that could actually further see potential downside pressure of the dollar yen. Very similar, if you look at the longer term one, the 10-year JGB yield, no, the 10-year US Treasury yield minus the 10-year JGB yield spread is also going to inch downwards, but the, moment, the, the, the steepness of inching downwards is not so pronounced as the two-year spread. So very similar as well, it's also portraying a ongoing medium term downtrend between the yield spread of the 10 year US Treasury yield minus the 10 year JGB yield also potentially reducing the attractiveness of using yen as a carry trade indirectly putting further potential downside pressure on the dollar yen from a medium term perspective all right so this is the intraday not intraday this is the inter 
the medium term intermarket dynamics that I want to share with you all that is taking shape in the markets right now. Pardon me, a bit of time twisting, not intraday. Medium term intermarket dynamics that is taking shape in the market. Now, let us now focus our attention to the short term intraday movement of the markets from a technical perspective, starting from the FX market first. All right. So now with that, let me uh, so-called expand my screen so that you guys could see a clearer picture. So before we jump to the euro dollar, let's have another closer look at this, uh, we call it five day rolling performance of the dollar against the major currency. So I could see over here, we start to see a very upper K-shaped performance where the dollar is strengthening the most against the Aussie. But however, uh, kind of go sideways against the other currency. All right. So in fact, the dollar uh, starts to inch slightly lower against the sterling over here and also starts to inch slightly lower against the euro. But and the but however, the dollar strength seems to be recovering against the yen. All right. Means the earlier dollar weakness has starts to do a bit of mean reversion rebound against the Japanese yen over here. So what I could see over here is from a intraday movement, it's a rather mixed bag performance if you look at the dollar against the other major currency on a closer inspection. Okay, so with that, now let us now jump into the short term intraday technical outlook on the euro dollar. So on the euro dollar yesterday, we do have a bearish bias. First support level to watch will be at the 1.08 figure level. Then second support level to watch will be at the 1.0770 level. And yesterday it hit the first support level, which is also the 50 day and the 200 day moving average and started to shape a bounce into today's Asia session. And upon the hitting of this 1.08 support level, which is the first support level that we highlight yesterday in our yesterday's short term intraday bearish bias on the euro dollar, the, the, the hourly RSI also started to shape that bullish divergence. Okay, so it came to us that yesterday's bearish momentum has already more or less been washed out or eradicated. That means, i.e., there could be a chance of a short term mean reversion rebound taking shape on the euro dollar for today given the current technical element that is short term technical element that is playing out right now. So this is the hourly chart of the euro dollar. So on the hourly chart, we're now looking from a very short term intraday perspective. So with this positive short term, uh, we call it technical element that is playing out, I'll be using yesterday's first support level at the 1.08 figure level, 1.08. As my short term pivotal support, we saw confluence with two key moving averages, the 50 day and as well as the yellow line, the 200 day moving average over here. Flip to a short term intraday bullish bias for a potential mean reversion rebound scenario to unfold. First resistance level to watch 1.0850, which confluence with the 20 day moving average. Above it exposes the next near term intraday resistance level to watch will be at 1.0880 level. That's for the euro dollar. Now, shaping our focus next will be on the sterling dollar. So the sterling dollar continues to inch down lower within our expectation. So uh, then inch down lower over here within our expectation. So yesterday we do have a bearish bias on the sterling dollar itself. So with that, uh, it's now trading in the middle of nowhere, still below the short term uh, pivotal resistance that we highlighted yesterday at 1.2890. So we will still maintain this 1.2890 as my short term pivotal resistance level to maintain that short term intraday bearish bias for this potential residual decline drop to test the first near term support level at 1.2780. And this level is pretty key because it's confluencing with two key elements, the 50 day I think as a moving average and as well as this turquoise uh, green line here, which is this uh, medium term ascending trend line that is in place since 22nd of April swing low, right? This two level over here. So at this point in time, uh, I would like to see if price actually hit this level, if the RSI starts to shape a bullish divergence at that juncture, potentially uh, that could be the start of a mean reversion rebound scenario taking shape around the 1.2780 support level. And right now it hasn't hit that, this support level yet. Okay, because it's trading in the middle of nowhere at this point in time. Okay, only an hourly close above 1.2890 will invalidate uh, this 
intraday bearish bias on the sterling dollar to see the kick, the start of this uh, mean reversion rebound scenario taking shape to expose the next near term resistance level at 1.2940 followed by 1.2990 right for the sterling dollar okay just now i think i didn't cover the euro dollar alternative scenario that means i.e if we start to see a breakdown below 1.08 figure level then uh, forget about this ongoing mean reversion rebound instead the price action will continue this uh, minor corrective decline scenario to expose the next near-term support at 1.0770 followed by 1.0730 next okay now Moving on will be the uh, Asia Pacific currency against the dollar, starting with the Aussie dollar. So the Aussie dollar yesterday, we do have a bearish bias for those who recall 65.80 as my short term pivotal support. That's also that 200 day moving average. This morning it plunges, reinforced by the not so hot Australia CPI numbers or CPI data almost hit the first support level at 64, 65 before shipping a minor bounce over here. So with that, uh, I will actually tighten uh, today's key short term pivotal support level. So this line here, okay, let me remove this. Okay, this level here. Let me copy, control V. Okay, this one will be at 65.34. 65.34, okay. And this will be a normal resistance. Okay, so using a Titan key short term pivotal resistance for today, which was this minor swing low area that is in place since uh, yesterday US session. And after that, it actually shaped that bearish breakdown and this should turn into a key pullback resistance at least on an intraday basis. 6534, tighten key short-term pivotal resistance for today or the Aussie dollar, still maintaining that short-term intraday bearish bias. Next, next support level to watch 6465, followed by 64 figure level, which is the minor swing low area of uh, 16th of April and 18th of April this year. Only a push up with an hourly close above 65.34 will invalidate today's intraday bearish bias on the Aussie dollar to potentially kickstart a mean reversion rebound scenario. Near term resistance to watch in this potential mean reversion rebound scenario that could potentially unfold after the breakout of the break above the 65.34 short term pivotal resistance level will be at 65.80 followed by 66.10 level, okay? That's for the Australia dollar. Now, moving on will be the dollar yen. Okay, so the dollar yen over here, let us go to the daily chart first, okay? So on the daily chart over here, very clearly, what we could see over here is that the RSI is in the oversold level, but there's no bullish divergence yet on the RSI being oversold. And what we could see over here is that very clearly the price has really plummeted below the 50 day moving average. So indicating to us that there could be still further potential movement on the downside. Why? Because uh, a break below the 50 day moving average that has kept previous, uh, we call it price action since 15th of March this year. So that's more than about three months. So indicating to us that the medium term uptrend phase has been damaged on the dollar yen and potentially uh, we could start to see a further downside at least the next step to test the 14965 level. What's this 14965 level? So 14965 level is pretty key. This is a major support level because it confluence with the major ascending channel that I drew from the low of 16th of January 2023. All right, so that's more than a year of year old, more than one year old of more than one year old of ascending channel. So a breakdown below 14965 potentially could kickstart a not even a multi-week corrective decline. It could just split into a multi-month corrective decline. All right. Okay, so that's from a longer term, medium term perspective, uh technical outlook using the daily chart of the dollar yen. But on a short term perspective, as we know that price don't move vertical so on the hourly chart of the dollar yen over here uh 
yesterday we do have a uh, kind of a, 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 a bullish uh, bias looking for the price action to actually hit the first resistance zone of 15580 slash 15650 level. All right. So price action yesterday hit an intraday high of 155.22. Okay. Almost there, almost the first resistance. Then thereafter, it shaped a plunge down over here. Okay. Before showing signs of a rebound again, right exactly at the 15170 short term pivotal support that we have yesterday as well, which also confluence with the 200 day moving average level. So with this level still holding at 15170, we will still maintain that short term intraday bullish bias for another leg of mean reversion rebound to take shape. We in a medium term downtrend phase that is still playing out. Why? Because the price action is still below the 50 day moving average over here. Okay. So now what we was looking at over here is more like an oscillation on the upside, potential upside. We in a medium term downtrend phase that is still unfolding. All right, so 15170 short term pivotal support as long as this level didn't surpass to the downside, we'll still maintain that intraday bullish bias for this potential minor mean reversion rebound scenario to play out. But first resistance level to watch will be at 15460 level. Okay, this 15460 level only above 15460 level may expose this resistance zone of 15580 slash 15650 level. Okay, so if you were to do the FIBO retracement of this entire movement down since the high of 3rd of July all the way down to the low over here. Okay, so this level 155.880 slash 15650 is corresponding close to the 38.2% and the 50% FIBO retracement. All right, so only an hourly close, let's say if price action starts to break down and have an hourly close below 15170, then this mean reversion rebound scenario will be invalidated because of respect the price action and that actually advocate for further potential uh, weakness. That means continuation of this impulsive down move within its medium term downtrend phase to expose the next near term support level in first step at 15880 slash 40, 15 figure slash 14950 level. If you go back in time, it corresponds to this congestion area here, 9 of February and 1st of March. Okay, so that's for the dollar yen intraday technical outlook for today as we await for the BOJ uh, decision that's going to out around 20 minutes times or so. Okay, so now that sum up the intraday technical outlook on the FX market. Now let us focus now our attention to the intraday technical outlook on the major stock indices, starting with the Asia Pacific major indices first, the Hong Kong 33 or the Hansen index. So the Hansen index yesterday, we were neutral between 17,200 and 16,970. So in today's Asia session, right at the start, it broke above the 17,200 level, the upper limit of the neutrality range. So with this breakout of the upper limit of the neutrality range, we will flip to a short term intraday bullish bias, still using 16,970 as my short term pivotal support level potentially uh, to see this kind of minor mean reversion rebound taking shape again. Near term resistance level to watch will be at 17,517 followed by 17,650, which correspond to the downward sloping 20 day moving average. I think as a resistance level as well. However, if price action starts to come down and break below the 16,970 level again, then uh, this impulsive down move should resume more or less to expose the next near term support level at 16,840 followed by 16,620 next on the Hansen index, i.e. the Hong Kong 33. Moving on will be the DK225 and the Japan 225. So the Japan 225 yesterday, we do have 38,750 as my short term pivotal resistance level, looking for a bearish bias to retest 37,630 as my first support level, which is the minor swing low last Friday. Almost came close to this level before bouncing back up. 
All right. So uh, technical elements right now on a short term basis for the Japan 225 or the Nikkei 225 is rather mixed at this juncture. So uh, we will actually flip to a neutrality stance for today on the intraday basis. That means IE kind of sideways between 38,750 and 37,630 level. Only a uh, breakdown below 37,630 will resume this impulsive intraday down move movement to retest the 200 day moving average that's acting as support at 37,105. A breakdown below it may see a further extension towards 36,495 next. So 36,495 was this level. If you go back in time over here, is in fact this former minor swing high of 5th of February 2024. Okay, so that's for the Nikkei 225 or the Japan 225. Now moving on will be the German 30 or the German DAX over here. So the German DAX yesterday also did a very nasty sideways range. Uh, we saw around the 20 day and the 50 day moving average. So uh, with that rather mixed price action movement on the German 30. So for today, we will flip to a neutrality stance instead for the German 30 or rather than having that bearish stance for it to retest the lower limit of this expanding wedge at 18,145, which is the purple line over here that I drew from the minor swing low of 14th of June this year. So neutral between 18,520 and 18,388. Five level. So only a breakdown with an hourly close below 18,385 will reinstate that short term intraday bearish outlook on the German 30 or the German DAX to retest the next near term support level at 18,150, which is potentially also close to the lower limit of this expanding wedge. Okay, that, that is in place since the low of uh, 7, 14 of June this year. Okay, so that's for the German 30. Okay, so now moving on will be the major U.S. stock indices. So the major U.S. Uh, stock indices starting with the U.S. Wall Street 30, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average yesterday, we do have a neutrality stance due to its prior day mixed elements. So yes, yesterday we were neutral between 4,800 and 40,385. Indeed, a neutrality range tested, can't break above and shape that pullback. But what's interesting over here is that the hourly RSI continue to be supported by this rising parallel trend line. So indicating some form of bullish momentum, short term bullish momentum that starts to creep back into the US Wall Street 30 index on a short term perspective on the hourly chart. So with that, we will flip back to a intraday bullish bias on the US Wall Street 30, i.e. the Dow Jones Industrial Average using for sure 40,380 as my short term pivotal uh, support level. First resistance level, a breakout at 40,800 40, may see further potential uh, upside to expose the next near term resistance at 41,050 next. Okay, from a short term intraday perspective. However, if it's the price action starts to come down and have an hourly close below 40,380, then this short term intraday bullish bias will be invalidated to see a choppy downward drift to retest the next near term support level at 40,030 slash 39,890, which confluence with the minor swing low area of 25th of June and also very closely the rising 20 day moving average. Okay, so what we could see over here is that very clearly the Dow Jones Industrial Average is still trading within a short term and medium term uptrend. Why? Because it's still holding above the 20 day and the 50 day moving average as well. So this is one of the capabilities of uh, trading view where we could actually overlay a longer term technical element on a shorter term chart over here. So what I did over here, this is not a 20 hour moving average, it's a 20 day moving average. Okay. We could actually do that. Something like a multi time frame uh, trading analysis on a single chart itself. So if you look at the NASDAQ 100, now very quickly, shift the NASDAQ 100, very clearly it's trading below the 20 day and the 50 day moving average. So indicating to us that it's still in a short to medium term downtrend. Like I say, price action on an intraday basis don't go vertical up or vertical down, they oscillate within this trend. So that means, i.e., at any point in time, there could be a mean reversion playing out within its medium term downtrend as well. So what's as interesting over here is that yesterday we do have a bearish bias, 19,230. During the start of the US session, it tried to test this level, come break and all the way it's so off and hit exactly at our support that we highlighted 18,650 level, which is the one time FIBO extension as well and close to the lower limit of this uh, descending channel support level. So with this strong bounce that we are actually taking shape on the intraday basis. So this black candlestick was actually the announcement of Microsoft 
earnings result, yes, it came down, but after that, not much bearish pressure. It shaped an hourly can hourly bullish hammer, and thereafter it going to trade higher. So given this watershed movement in terms of important news flow from a key component stock hitting at a key short term support level and coming taking shape of a bounce, it actually increased the odds of a mean reversion rebound scenario that could play out in the Nasdaq 100 at this juncture. And with this highlighted positive element that I share with you all, and also the hourly RSI has started to shape a bullish divergence as well. After that watershed low, reinforced by a key news flow event, which is the earnings result of Microsoft. Why is it important? Because Microsoft is the top, is the top three heavy weightage component stock of Nasdaq 100. All right. There's a bullish divergence over here. So with this positive element and the watershed movement, positive reaction after a watershed news flow event, using 18,650 short-term pivotal support flipped to a short-term intraday bullish bias on the Nasdaq 100 for this potential mean reversion rebound scenario to play out. First resistance level, 19,230 for sure. Above it exposes the 50-day moving average that is acting as a resistance at 19,520. So if we will do the FIBO retracement of this entire down move from 11th of July high, autumn high to this Asia session low, today's intraday Asia session low, the 19,520 also confluence with the 38% FIBO retracement level. Okay. However, if price action starts to come down and have an hourly close below 18,650, then this intraday bullish outlook bias will be invalidated to see the continuation of this impulsive down move within its short term and medium term downtrend phase to, to accelerate on the downside. Next near term support that it may get exposed to will be at 18,390 slash 18,360, followed by 18,125. All right. So that sum up the intraday technical outlook on the major stock indices. So now let us focus our attention to the commodities market, starting with Go XAU slash USD. So for Go XAU slash USD, for sure, price action continues to be very positive. Hit our first resistance at 2,411 level. Yesterday, we do have a short-term pivotal support at 2,373 2, to maintain our short-term intraday bullish outlook. What is the current latest technical short-term element on Go XAU slash USD? Still positive. Why? Because the price action on the hourly RSI hasn't shaped a bearish divergence yet at the overbought level. So uh, yes, it's coming close to the overbought level. Potentially, there could be a bit of minor pullback. So minor pullback's first support level to watch will be at yesterday's breakout level of 2,394, which correspond now to a pullback support level of the 20, also the 20-day moving average, I think as a support at 2,395 level as well. So this could be the first level to watch on a potential pullback. But however, that pullback shouldn't surpass below yesterday's intraday swing low, which is the US session low at 2,383. So this 2,383 will be my new Titan short-term pivotal support for today to maintain our short-term intraday bullish bias on spot go on go XAU U, XAU slash USD. Pardon me. So as long as the pullback didn't surpass below 2,383, we will still maintain that short-term intraday bullish outlook. First resistance to watch now for today will be at 2,431, which was the minor swing high of 24th of July. Pretty psychologically key. Key. Why? Because of that inverted V shape that it took shape afterward. All right. A breakup above 2,431 uh, potentially could kickstart another round of, we call it uh, impulsive up move up leg sequence to actually uh, test the next near term resistance over here at 2,452. 2,452 over here. Okay, 2,452, and potentially this could kickstart a new impulsive up move uh, sequence, as in a bullish wave one, wave two, and now it's showing a bullish impulsive wave three with uh, at least a minimum target of one time. Okay, over here. Okay, this are uh, 1.236, and uh, the extension one standardized 1 1.618, which correspond very closely to the graphical resistance I highlighted as well. All right, however, only a hourly close, a breakdown below this Titan key short term pivotal support that we have for today at 2,383 will negate this 
short-term intraday bullish bias to see another round of choppy movement for it to drift down to retest the 50-day moving average, which is correspond to the minor swing low of last Friday at 2,353. Only a breakdown below 2,353 will see the extension of this minor corrective decline to expose the next near-term support level at 2,357 followed by 2,320 next. That's for gold, XAU slash USD. Moving on next, lastly, will be the West Texas crude oil. So uh, West Texas crude oil continues to be bearish yesterday, hit the support level uh, 74.46 before shaping a bounce off in today's Asia session. So no change, uh, still using 77.25 as my short-term pivotal uh, resistance level. We are so close to the upper limit of this descending channel that I drew from the high of 18th of July still maintain that short-term intraday bearish bias on West Texas oil. A breakdown below 74.46 may expose 74.76 next, which is a cluster of FIBO extension level as well, two times and 0 0.4, 0 0.764. Only an hourly close, a breakout above 77.25 will invalidate today's intraday bearish bias on West Texas oil to see a mean reversion rebound to retest the 200-day moving average that is acting as a resistance at 78.90. Above it may see an extension of the mean reversion rebound to the key medium-term resistance at $80.30. So that's West Texas crude oil. We also sum up today's intraday technical outlook on the major cross asset classes. So either than the BOJ, it's out later about, I think, four minutes. All right. Okay. I don't know she's out yet. Still not out yet later, later I'll try to refresh again. But what other important data to look out for for today? For sure, uh, in the European session, we do have the uh, France preliminary inflation data uh, for July. That's out at 2.45 p.m. Singapore time. And after that, you have the Eurozone inflation rate uh, preliminary fresh data out at 5 p.m. Singapore time for the month of July. So market expecting a slight dip below 2.4% for 2.5% in the previous month of June. But the more important one will be at 2 a.m. Singapore time where we start to see the Fed interest rate decision as well and also the Fed, Fed, Ch Fed Chair Powell press conference at 2.30 a.m. Singapore time. So more or less market is still looking out for the first interest rate cut to come in in the September meeting. No change about that. But what market wants to hear is how confident is uh, Fed Chair Powell in embarking the start of a interest rate cut cycle in US starting from the September FOMC meeting. And also from a, uh, let me share with you guys from a earnings perspective over here. I think there are, okay, give me a minute. I need to share with you the earnings calendar. Okay, sorry, I think it's hang right now. <laughs> give me a minute, uh, I think it's, okay, oops. Okay, because there are a couple of earnings I'm gonna share with you, okay. Come on, come on. Okay, give me a minute. Ah, uh, oops, it's hang. It's really hang this time round. Okay, stop. Okay. Okay. So they actually rose. Uh, it, it rise the interest rate to 0.25 percent over here. Okay, 0.25 percent. So what? Let's see what happened in the dollar yen movement. Okay, on the dollar yen. Okay, notice there is a test at the 51.70 exactly, and there's a bounce, all right? So this level is indeed a key pivotal support that we got to respect from a technical perspective. And the bounce is a hammer. It's right now showing an intraday hammer. Okay, so more or less, if this level continues to uh, there is a, it's still valid for a potential mean reversion rebound scenario that I explained to you all earlier, all right? So now with that, uh, now let's go back to the calendar again because I want to actually highlight to you guys the earnings. Okay. Yeah, over here. Open a new tab. Okay, good. So we go all the way down. Okay, so on Wednesday, after the close of the US session, we do have one key mega cap technology stocks as reporting, which is Meta. And Meta right now, the consensus is very, very rosy uh, in terms of their earnings, uh, we call it uh, expectation. So earnings per share for this uh, last quarter, that means Q2 is $4.70, way, way above one year ago at the same quarter at 
two dollars ninety eight cents. Okay, so it's pretty much rosy uh, over here. So uh, yeah, let's see how it plays out today at early to miss IE early tomorrow Asia session after four a.m. the closure of the U.S. stock market. All right. So uh, with that, do have a great day ahead, and we shall speak again tomorrow. This is Kelvin here signing off. Thank you.